I'm honored to welcome you to the Maryland State Police Commemoration of Black History Month. Thank you for joining us for this important opportunity to reflect on what this month means to the Maryland State Police family not only at this time, but throughout the year. Once again, I'm using a video as a substitute for something I would rather be doing in person. Unfortunately, the pandemic precautions continue to keep us apart. I hope this video tribute will be an appropriate substitute until we can get together again as family. I was born in Dorchester County. Harriet Tubman was also born in Dorchester County, but she was born into slavery. Her life as a slave was brutal. Her work began when she was just a child. She worked as a nursemaid and was whipped when the baby cried. She was rented out to work for other plantation owners. Still a child, she was forced to work as a field hand in Dorchester and Caroline counties. In her early teens, Harriet Tubman stepped between another slave and an angry overseer. She sustained a head injury that left her permanently disabled. Harriet Tubman never lost her desire to be free. In her late 20s, she escaped Dorchester County and fled north. Hiding by day and running by the light of the North Star at night, she made it to freedom. Although she had gained her own freedom, she had never forgotten those still in slavery. Harriet Tubman returned repeatedly to Maryland and to other states to rescue slaves. With her unshakable courage and the assistance of the Underground Railroad, she personally led scores of slaves to freedom and assisted with the rescue plans for many more. She became the most well-known conductor on the Underground Railroad. Her service was not done when the war broke out. During the Civil War, she worked as a Union spy and refused compensation. She worked for women's rights after the Civil War. I'm here today in the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Visitor Center in Cambridge. Although the roadside signs, monuments, and lessons of Harriet Tubman's feats have been part of my life since I was a kid, this is a place of continued learning. This is a place that provides an unvarnished look at the past so we can forge a better future. This is also a place that reminds me how important it is to reflect on black history and influence, not only in our nation's past, but in our own lives. It is also a place that inspires and motivates for the work still to be done. Is black history important to me? I wouldn't be here today in this position without those African-American troopers, long retired, who set an example for me early on. I have often said there are many people who shaped my life and enabled me to serve in the position I currently hold. Fortunately for me, I had enough sense to watch, listen, and value those individuals during my state police career. Many of those influences were African Americans. Their ranks varied, but they were all leaders in their own right. The qualities that influenced me were the same ones that ultimately placed them in supervisory and command roles throughout the department. Although I cannot name them all in this presentation, I am thankful for each of them. Many decades have passed, but the impact they made remains vivid. Before I share a few of thoughts of my own, we have reflections from some others in our Maryland State Police family. As I went through from trooper to lieutenant colonel, there were so many people whose shoulders I stood on, who helped me get there. When I was a new trooper at the JFK Highway Barrack, 1977, I happened to go off duty and I went to a shopping mall in my neighborhood, small shopping center. And there was, uh, as I was leaving, I was heading back to my car in the parking lot and I passed this gentleman, he was an old, older black gentleman, elderly, and he was walking with a cane. So he was kind of looking down. And I said, good afternoon, sir. And he looked up and he, he looked me up and down. You know, I had my Stetson on and everything. And he was looking at me and he just reached his hand out and put his hand on my, on my arm and said, boy, I don't even know you, but I'm so proud of you because when I was your age, there was no such thing. That's still emotional to me because regardless of 
everything that I encountered in the state police, my dreams, uh, frustrations, my joy of being a trooper, that one significant moment told me what is important in life and what you represent sometimes. Now that I have been on the road almost six years now, it, I've noticed that just my presence in the community makes a difference. It has been many of times that I've pulled someone over or stopped someone on a traffic stop and it just blows people's mind that when they see a black female in a Maryland State Police uniform, the looks that I get, it's just, it blows my mind actually, because <laughs> they're just like, didn't know you existed, didn't know this happened. So I didn't understand how important my presence was until people actually started saying, I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy that you're doing what you're doing. You keep doing what you're doing. So that makes me happy to see people, I guess, that look like me um, in the same profession as I am. It doesn't necessarily have to be state police, it's any profession. Whenever I see anyone, female, black, white, it just makes me happy to see that there are other people out there like me that are able to do the job. We all have our challenges in life. Some challenges can be a little bit more daunting than others. You find you find a little bit of an emotional comfort when you see someone that looks like you, that you know have been through the same things that you have. But you know, I remember running around the parking lot at headquarters when I could look over and and see people of rank. You know, Major Leatherberry might be up there. You know, it could be then uh, I think it was Detective Sergeant Dennis. Uh, at that point, it could have been Detective Sergeant uh, Stu Russell. When you saw them and just the way they carried themselves, it lets you know you were on the right, right track and everything was going to be okay. Entering the Academy in 1994, it, it was an arduous task, but you got to see a lot of people walking around that inspired you to continue going on. Graduation was my first opportunity to meet then Major Leatherberry, who later went on to become the first African-American Bureau Chief. Upon being assigned to Howard County sometime later in my career, four to five years later, I actually had the opportunity to sit down and talk with the first African-American state trooper, Captain Milton Taylor. It was an interesting conversation. I had about 30 minutes. He was working as a bailiff to, to talk to him about everything under the sun. And, and it kind of brightened my day. It, it brightened my approach to the job. Hearing somebody that had fought so many battles along the way, persevered, yet was so humble. At the time, I was working for Sergeant Anthony Satchel, who later became a Bureau Chief himself, Lieutenant Colonel, Special Operations Bureau, and then the Field Operations Bureau. To go back and be able to share that experience with him, it changed my approach to what I was doing with the State Police somewhat. So you think about some of the things that your mentor said, whether it was Captain Dennis, whether it was Detective Sergeant Wartman, whether it was De Detective Sergeant Barry Myers, people along the way that, that just thought about what they did what the impact was going to be and told you, hey, build your knowledge base. Every bit of knowledge you have, you have the opportunity to pass on and make someone else better. I am part of an outstanding tradition. To wear this badge is an honor. Black History Month means that we are celebrating our African-American culture and the roles that our co-workers hold in the, the department. And I tell you one who I really admire, and that is Ida Williams. She is somebody that I really admire and really look up to. 
she has a division over there that is very important within the agency and she manages it so well that um, it's seamless and that inspires me to say well I can be the same type of leader. I attended the Black History Month meeting that took place last year. So it gave me some insight on some of the figures who have played a big role in the Maryland State Police. Some of the mentors that I have today, such as um, Captain Savage, Lieutenant Fortune. I met the first African-American female trooper. I almost cried because I told her, I was like, you are like a star that I've just never seen before. I feel like I completely froze in my feet. Um, she was so humble and so inspirational. And she just kept saying to me, if you ever need anything, give me a call. And being able to attend that meeting, it was great because I, was, I had the opportunity to meet her and other figures who I probably would have never met. Those figures that have moved up along the ranks, they've motivated me to become what I am today, which is a supervisor. So it's allowed me to reach out to the younger troopers and be able to show them that um, if I can do it, you can do it. There's no one preventing you from your dream. You can turn around and make it happen. I did see the Maryland State Police uh, recruitment video that came out a few years ago. And in that video, um, there are a couple of troopers, CFC Flowers Jackson and Corporal uh, Walker. And seeing them, those are the first two African-American state troopers that I was exposed to. So that caught my interest. And then throughout my career as a cadet, um, I got to meet Lieutenant Dwayne Hill um, retired detective in TFC Devito Washington and um, TFC Rowe and meeting those people just stacked on my motivation to become a state trooper. When I graduate and become a Maryland state trooper, uh, I have the opportunity to connect with the black community and show the world that we are out there and we are out in law enforcement and we are on the highways and we are there to save you if we have to. You know, in 1987, I was—I uh, had applied for uh, the position of cadet with the Maryland State Police. And of course, when you apply, there's a lot of recommendations that uh, you ride along with the trooper. So uh, me being in Dorchester County here, the, the trooper that I ended up riding with quite often was uh, Trooper April Wilson. And, uh, you know, April was, uh, was a hard worker. As a, as a cadet applicant, obviously you want to go in and you want to get uh, as much action as you can. You want to see what the job's all about. And she worked very hard with her shift partners to uh, create that outcome for me particularly. Um, but one of the things with April that, that I will never forget, and you know, we talk about our core values and, and what they mean to us. And this was a very early example of one of those core values being uh, brought to my attention and I've, I've never forgotten this story even, even after I guess 33 years now is uh, I was riding with her on a late shift one day and uh, we had met at the Cambridge Hospital and she had uh, had a crash investigation and uh, we had to run to a call in Talbot County and uh, she had the radar set on the front seat of her car and as I got into the car to do the ride along, we put the set in, into the dash and just plugged it in. And as, as we're crossing the Chop Tank River Bridge into Talbot County, and even me with practically no uh, uh, radar experience, there was a car that was coming east that was clearly flying. And I remember the numbers showing up on the radar set saying 88 miles per hour. 
And of course, you know, at that point in my time, I was ready to chase everything and everything we could, get into as much as we could. And when I saw those numbers pop up on the radar, I thought, okay, we're gonna go chase this car down. And we kept going and I was like, hey, what's going on? She says, that radar set was never calibrated. And um, while I know that's what the speed uh, of that vehicle was, the radar wasn't calibrated and we were gonna operate within our policies and the, the, be on the right side of the law. And I've never, ever forgotten that. And that's just that core value of integrity. And, and she, she nailed that into me uh, before I was even actually officially on the job. And you know, that's something that after 33 years, I, I'm very thankful that uh, she, she had that conversation with me. And while many could have said many of different things, uh, that could be an interpreted uh, many of different ways. She clearly wanted me to understand that we do things the right way for the right reasons, and that's how we enforce the law. And uh, you know, uh, there's many, many other stories with that that April uh, and I could share. Um, but it's all about going out there, working hard, treating people like they want to be treated. And when when the time came to do the job. She was not bashful about doing it. And she, she was a great example uh, amongst many at that time in my life uh, of what this job was about. You know, as, as I move forward, obviously I, I came on as a cadet and when I went into the uh, police academy, um, I, I'd met people that I had never, uh, me being an Eastern Shore boy, so to speak, I'd met many people uh, that I had never had contact with. I, I didn't know anyone from the uh, Washington metropolitan area, uh, Western Maryland, uh, North, South, and it was a new experience for me. And I remember as we're sitting in our academy class, we had to pick a class president. Um, and, um, you know, at that time, um, I didn't know anybody. There was just a couple of us from the shore, but, but our class president ended up being a now retired uh, Lieutenant Wesley Fortune. And I've known Wes obviously for 30 years. Um, I just had the opportunity to uh, retire the remaining classmates of class 102 uh, at the end of December of 2020. And he was the last one that I did. And uh, he has led such a meaningful career with the Maryland State Police. Uh, he was heavily engaged in the special operations part of what we do. And he could be one that was absolutely depended on every day, all day, and when you were wrong, he would call you on it. And uh, there's many things I learned about tactical operations through my early years in the department, but Wes was always one of those ones that I could go to and say, hey, I, how, why am I struggling to understand how we're doing business here? And he could put it in such a way that made sense to me. Um, so his influence, uh, while we didn't work together that often, he made an impact, and that's the kind of stuff that is so important to, to who I've become today. Um, as, as I came out of the academy, I went to Berlin Barrack, and uh, El Moses Harvey, he was a corporal then, retired as a sergeant. He was my first uh, supervisor, and, and he, he was excellent. He, he was truly excellent. I was nervous. Obviously, coming out of the academy, I didn't know anything, uh, so to speak. And, uh, but he, he would, he would uh, kick me in the tail when I needed it. And, but at the same time, when it was done, it was done. And I worked with him for the next two or three years in the capacity of a corporal and a sergeant. And he always looked out for the agency and its people and making sure that that presence and the way we did our business was, was beyond reproach. And, you know, even in the end, God, unfortunately, he's passed and, and left us. But, um, you know, just, just a smile on his face. Um, he could chew your butt and then laugh in the, all in the same sentence. And he just I always felt that he cared. And that's what's so important. And that's something that as a department that we, we just need to make sure that we never lose sight of as it's about our people. They're the greatest resource that we have and just Showing someone that you care is so important to people coming to work every day and doing the job that they do. Uh, you know, moving on to my, my early days of road patrol, and then I, I had the opportunity to go into the old BDCE. And um, my first sergeant in BDCE was uh, David Briscoe. And, you know, Dave, uh, 
I mean, I was at Salisbury Barrack at the time. We, we were getting crushed with cases. And uh, at that point, there was no administrative investigation unit. So all those administrative investigations that came down came to us as investigators to, to, to complete. But Dave, he took every administrative investigation that came into that barrack so we as investigators could focus on the criminal work, the protecting Marylanders, and doing what we do best. And he never relented. He was always in his office and was taking care of all those little things to allow us to run and do the job that we were here to do. That's all part of it. Um, but, but Dave had, a, had this great way of no matter how bad of a day you were having, you could walk in his office and, and you know, uh, he, he would just say something or his laugh was just contagious. And, and we had some rough, rough times in those days. Uh, and I could, I could walk out of my office and turn the corner and there he was. And a lot of times I could just look and uh, he knew I was having a bad day and he would just laugh and it just made everything better. And he cared, he looked out for us once again all the time. Uh, it, it is just so important to have that, that amount of leadership that, you know, very unsuspecting, very humble. Um, he was just there and we always knew he was there and that's what mattered to us. So, uh, you know, dur during these times too, um, you know, we, we talk about presence in the academy and uh, uh, now, now retired uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lashley, Ed Lashley, uh, I always remember, you know, during my time early on is talking about presence and, and how important that is. And that often, you know, that often presence is what creates the outcome that's, that's uh, most favorable for everyone involved. And, and that man uh, was, was constantly uh, focused on presence. And this is a guy that I used to see wearing his hat at the gas pump. And we used to laugh about it. And he, he, that's where he, you would see him, is wherever you went, whether it was in Pikesville, whether it was on the Eastern Shore, he always had his hat on. And he, he focused on clean cars, sharp uniforms, and he uh, many times, on many different occasions, would back me up. And as he would walk away, I'd be on, whether it be a traffic stop or working on an investigation, he would walk away from me and he would look at my cruiser and go, nice car nice car and you know just having that impact of presence who we are as Maryland State Troopers that 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 was ground into my 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 uh, my, my uh, values early early on uh, and I, I can keep you know he ended up being a lieutenant colonel uh, the next uh, few people that I'm going to speak about all ended up being lieutenant colonels so, so the next one uh, I, I was a very young trooper uh, out of Princess Anne Barrack, and we only worked two in a county. And you know, oftentimes with the way Somerset County is designed, uh, your, your shift partner would be in Crisfield, and you would be on the north end of the county, uh, like Deal Island or Mount Vernon or those areas. And oftentimes you were going to hot calls by yourself. Uh, that's just the nature of, of, of what it was back in those days. But I, I will never forget the comfort of being at a call and, and all of a sudden I see a, a shiny uh, cruiser pull up and it was Major then, retired Lieutenant Colonel Ernie Leatherberry. And he would walk up to me, get out of his car and he'd walk up to me and he wouldn't say Trooper Jones, he'd say, Jerry, Jerry, is there anything I can do to help you here? And he knew his people. He had a very humble way about him and he would be there. He didn't impose himself into the investigation. He didn't give direction. He didn't micromanage. He would just simply be there and be that presence to have your back while you're doing your business. And you know, I would go do my, my, my job, come out, and he would look at me and say, you good? I said, yes, sir, thank you so much for coming out. And he would drive off, it's just that simple. And that wasn't a one-time uh, occurrence. That occurred many times. And, you know, it was all about family. And it wasn't troopers, it wasn't rank, it was by your name. Because he knew his people, he knew his people mattered, and he wanted to be there as he was to support his people as they were out there doing their job every day. You know, you take uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lashley, 
you take a Lieutenant Colonel Leatherberry, and then I get into Lieutenant Colonel uh, Stuart Russell. Um, I worked for Stu the first time when I was in BDCE. I was, I was a TFC and he was, uh, he was a lieutenant down on the lower shore. Uh, we, we ultimately worked together three or four more times. Uh, when I made a lieutenant at Annapolis, he was my troop captain. And then as he ex you know, accelerated through the ranks um, of major and then lieutenant colonel, he certainly oversaw bigger parts of the department, so we got to work together then. But I'll tell you one thing that Stu did. Uh, well, I can tell you many things that Stu did, but the first thing that Stu instilled in me and started me on a path of, you know, you talk about performance metrics, we hear about stops, we hear about arrests and that type of thing. Stu's focus was on people. And really, if you focus on the people, then the rest of those things will, will take care of themselves. And he started me on my path of, of learning that you know, most of the issues we deal with in the department, um, you know, it's not of people's intent to go out there and just arbitrarily do what they want to do maliciously. Oftentimes there's things outside of the job that are influencing their behavior at the job. And you know, it completely changed my mindset of, of focusing on people instead of just focusing on uh, role numbers and, and outright performance. And another thing that he, uh, he, he gave me um, that I, I use, I know I've used this phrase uh, probably in the last week or so, was um, obviously when you try to look at the future and anticipate what the future is gonna look like, that creates anxiety. And uh, I, I was on the phone with him, I was a lieutenant, uh, and he was my troop captain. We were talking about a, an incident that had occurred that was, uh, uh, very, very noteworthy, and um, had the potential for some, from, for some negative outcome. And I was trying to work through each of those pieces of negative outcome, and he stops me right mid-sentence and says, don't bleed until you're cut. And I said, what? He said, don't bleed until you're cut. You never know what the future is gonna come to you as, so don't try to anticipate it too much. And I've never forgotten that, and it completely reshaped how I view things. I, I think it, I know it made me a better leader because instead of trying to program and plan every step of, of everything I did, I just got into the rhythm of just taking it as it comes, using the experience, using the values, using the wisdom gained from all of these folks that I've mentioned and these reflections taking that and building upon it and, and just taking and making the right decision, using your gut, doing the right thing for the right reasons. And that's the kind of stuff that, that creates uh, leadership. And uh, I, I was very blessed to have him impart those and countless other um, situations where he, he just, you know, he gave and gave me that little bit of comfort I needed to, to push through into the next level. So uh, we, we've spent countless hours on the phone over the years, talking through things, tough, tough, really tough topics. And, um, and, and I'm much better and value all of that input because I, I think it has helped me be the best leader that I can be. So at the end of the day, all of these folks, you know, made all these contributions. And, and, and the, really the final one I wanna touch is on uh, recently retired uh, Trooper First Class, Charlie Lester. You know, there's a guy and you, you know, you don't appreciate someone fully until they're gone. But you know, he announced his retirement at the end of uh, December, 2020. And you know, you think back over the years, um, he, he, he was a, a, a pioneer of his own doing as the agency evolved over the years. He was a lot of the, the special operations as those teams started developing. He, he, was, he was one of the originators. Of, of pioneering those teams. But after doing a career with the state police, he did another 20 years. He had 45 years total service with, with the Maryland Department of State Police. He was always behind the scenes, but he made so much happen over the years. And just seeing him, you know, whether it was in incidents in DC or different issues um, around the state, when he would show up, very humbly, he would be there. and. It was just a sense of reassurance he created just being there. You know, when a major incident occurred, knowing Charlie was there just made everything better. And that, those, are, those, are, those are the ty types of, of people that have had such a great impact on my life. And, and there's many, many more. And 
at, at the end of the day, when you look back, it is all about the people that have gotten you to where you are, um, good or bad. None of these folks are perfect. They all made mistakes. Like we all, you know, none of us are perfect, but they never fell prey to um, those imperfections. And they acknowledged that mistakes were made when, when they occurred, but they always came back to who they were, what they represented, and that's the best that the Maryland State Police has to offer. It is all that is good in the Maryland State Police are embodied in these and so many other people that have had a great influence on not only me, but on the entire department. And it's an honor to sit here and reflect and, and think about the good times, the bad times that these people were part of and how it's, it's created such a better organization. Each of these individuals I've mentioned exemplified our core values of integrity, fairness, and service. They were honest and courageous. Their initiative was evident. Each of them was an example to me and to many others. These were individuals whose reactions or values did not change depending on your skin color. The most important colors to them were the olive drab and black of our uniforms and the tan of the Stetson that identified them as Maryland's finest. That is the importance of the Maryland State Police family. Regardless of who we are, where we are from, or what we look like, we are men and women who have each pledged to serve and protect the people of our state. We have also committed to look out for one another. We are a team, we are a family, we must care about each other. On the floorboards, just inside the cargo bay doors of each of our helicopters are painted these words, One Maryland. That theme should not be just a reminder for our helicopter crews. Each of us needs to approach our fellow troopers and civilian employees in that way. We are one family. We come from different races, different backgrounds and beliefs, but with respect and understanding for each other, we work together to achieve one purpose, to serve and protect the people of Maryland. We also need to view the citizens we serve in the same way, one Maryland. We are all equally important. No one is more or less important than another. Each person we encounter should be treated the way we would want a member of our family to be treated. We will not hinder the calls of law enforcement and we shall not and will not use race, creed, gender, sexual orientation or religion as a reason for that enforcement. We should celebrate the richness of black history in our nation, our state, and our department. While African American culture has influenced and shaped American history, we should never forget the horrors, the inequities, and the injustices that history includes. We should never forget the accomplishments and contributions of those who overcame the impossible and helped build a better nation and a better world. We should never forget that the Constitution we have sworn to uphold ensures the same rights and privilege to all Americans. We must recommit ourselves to protect those rights while not relenting in our obligation to bring to justice those who violate our laws. Forward movement is not realized without everyone contributing. It takes all of us. We must continue doing the right thing and fighting the good fight. With the right mindset, we will continue achieving our personal and professional goals as we continue our legacy for another hundred years. To those African Americans who had and continue to have an impact in my life, I say a heartfelt thank you. I cannot repay your kindness to me and I'm a better person for your wisdom. To the African American members of the Maryland State Police, both sworn and civilian, I say thank you for your continuing service. I am proud to work beside you as one of Maryland's finest.